All right. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we have Rebecca, who is going to be our instructor for our Getting to Know iPhones and iPads workshop. But before I turn things over to Rebecca, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Zoom uh, and some of the features that we're going to use today. So down in, if you take your mouse down to the bottom corner, uh, you should have the ability to change your speaker or volume settings. Uh, and then you'll also see a chat button. And the chat button is where we would like you to go ahead and put any of your questions. Um, as we go along today, we will also be pausing and uh, Rebecca will ask if there are any questions. And at that time, you can feel free to put them in the chat. But as soon as you have a question, feel free to put it in there and I will relay your uh, questions to Rebecca out loud. If you would like to speak your question rather than typing it out, so I know sometimes it can be really uh, take a long time to type things out. We do also have the raise hand feature, which looks like a little hand down there. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question verbally, and I'll go ahead and unmute you. Uh, you are all muted right now, and we cannot see your videos. Um, that is partly because this is the webinar format, uh, but we do want it to be interactive. We want you to ask questions as you have them, so please feel free to interrupt us and ask away. All right. Um, the other thing I want to mention, we do have live transcripts going. So if you'd like down in the bottom corner, you also have a little a little CC button. If you tap on that, you'll get the uh, live text scrolling across your screen of what we're saying out loud. Um, if that is something you are interested in, if it's there and you want to hide it, you can also hit that CC and then hide transcripts. OK. Uh, like I said, we are recording today. What we will do is we will send out the recording in a follow-up email. We do post the videos to our YouTube channel. Um, and we will also send the handout for today in that video. But I'm also going to go ahead and post it in the chat right now. So if you would like to, that is today's handout. Um, again, you can also just follow along with Rebecca as she goes through everything uh, today and then reference that handout after um, if you'd like. And you can always go back to watch those videos on YouTube, play the video, and pause it at any time so that you can then do the same things on your own device too. So, okay. Um, I think that's everything. <laughs> oh, I actually, that's not quite everything. Um, I'm Susan Minkler. I am our technology librarian here at the Champaign Public Library. And uh, I'm going to introduce Rebecca Van Dusen. She is one of our library associates here, and she will be teaching today's workshop. How you doing, Rebecca? Doing good. How are you? Great. I am doing awesome, actually. I'm excited. Okay, good. It's a lovely day here in Champaign. Yes. All right. I'm, so I'm excited to learn about iPhones and iPads because I know um, there are some things that are new. Yes, I'm excited to teach it. I am an iPhone user. I also have an iPad, iPad mini. Um, but yeah, I really like the devices overall. So I like teaching this class. All right, let me go ahead and I will share my PowerPoint here. And we'll jump right in. I hope you're seeing my PowerPoint. Oh, oh, I just closed it. Let me do that again. <laughs> we were, we were seeing it. <laughs> you were, and then I hit the X button instead of the expand it button. Let's see, where did that thing go? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my video, but I'll still be, still be audio here for you. Okay, sounds good. There we go. Okay, let me open that back up again. Share screen. It's kind of silly how they keep that X right close to the expand button. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> All right. I hope you're seeing the intro to iPhones and iPads front slide there. Yes, I am. OK, cool. All right. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. Um, as Susan was saying before, feel free at any point to stop and ask questions. Um, you're not going to be interrupting anything. The point of the class is to get you learning what you want to learn, right? So questions are part of that process. Um, and I should say, you don't have to have an iPhone or an iPad right now. Um, a lot of people attend just to kind of get a feel for the device. Maybe they're looking to buy one or learn more about them. So let's jump right into what we're going to talk about for today. So our agenda for the day is we're going to talk about the buttons on both devices. So we have an iPad iPad, um, just a regular iPad we have. We also have an iPhone. Uh, I have an iPhone 11 that I'll be sort of demoing a couple things on. Um, so we're going to talk about the buttons. We're also going to talk about the lock screen. So that's the screen that comes up before you unlock the device. We're also going to talk about the home screen and how to navigate on the home screen. 
we'll talk about some of the settings. Now, of course, settings is um, kind of a big topic. We're not going to cover every single thing in the settings menu. If you have a specific question that we don't cover, we can definitely come back to it as well. We're also going to talk about the task manager. Um, so that would be how to flip between apps, how to close apps. We're also just going to talk about apps in general, how to open them, how to download apps from the app store, how to delete apps, how to move them, creating folders, stuff like that. We'll also talk about widgets. Widgets were new with iOS 14. iOS is the um, operating system on um, iPads and iPhones. So OS stands for operating system. And then Apple puts that little I in there to designate that it's like a smartphone or a tablet. You may have heard of Mac OS on Apple computers. iOS is their, their operating system for devices. All right, so if you wanna maybe write in the chat what type of iPad or iPhone you have, that will sort of give, it a, give an idea of what all is out there. There are a number of different models of iPad. Um, so we, the one we're using today is a regular iPad. But there are also iPad Pros, iPad Airs, and iPad Minis. I personally have an iPad Mini. I really like it. It's a nice, smaller size, good to hold in your hand. Um, some people have iPad Pros. Those are really good if you're doing a lot of maybe photo editing or stuff like that. A lot of artists and people that work online um, use iPad Pros. Um, iPad Air, it's pretty similar to an iPad. It, I think it has a, a faster processing speed and the screen is a little bit bigger than the iPad mini. And of course, the iPad mini is just like the iPad, just smaller. Um, it's sort of like the size of a Kindle device. I would say it's pretty similar in size to that. It's really a good hand holding size, good for traveling. Really all of them are good for traveling, but I really like my iPad mini for it. So Rebecca, we have our first question about how do we find out what kind of iPad or iPhone we have? I will show you that uh, how to find that out once we get to our settings, but let me write that down so I don't forget it. How to find out. Basically, you can get into your settings and look at the information about your device and find out what model you have. I'll show you that once we get into the settings portion. How to find which iPad you have. and once you get into the settings as well, you can see things like how much storage you have available, um, what software you have, like which update you need to get, stuff like that. We'll talk about that once we get to settings. And we do have several folks that are in, uh, letting us know in chat what they have. We've got iPad Pros, iPhone 11s, um, nice. regular iPads. So we've got cool. um, quite, a, quite a few different devices. But luckily, yes. the I, iOS is pretty similar on, on both. So. Yes, for the most part with um, as long as you're updated to the most recent operating system, you're you should have the same experience across devices. Um, now older devices, they may not be able to upgrade to certain uh, software just because they're not capable. Um, but if you're and the most recent software, I think right now it's iOS 15. Um, so if you have that, you'll have what we're gonna show today, and it'll be the same across all of your devices. So iPhones are a little different too. Um, the most recent iPhone they just released, I think a couple of weeks ago is the iPhone 13. Um, and those will have either the two cameras or three cameras on the back. That's sort of how I tell what they are. Um, and there's also iPhone 10s, which was the first iPhone without a home button. Um, iPhone 6 through 8 will still have the home button. It's a newer phone that has the uh, home button. And then if you're in a later model, iPhones 4 and 5, those probably won't be supported anymore. So if you have one of those, it's probably a super old device, but those are still out there. Um, so you'll just see the different styles there. All right, so let's talk about iPhone buttons or iPad and iPhone buttons unless there's any other questions I can help answer. No more questions at this point. All right, so let me go ahead and make sure my, I'm gonna switch my video, I'm gonna stop my share. 
All right, and then I'm going to switch to our device view here. All right, so I hope you're seeing my iPad there. We are. OK, cool. Let me pin my view there. All right, so let me open up this iPad. Let me turn my brightness up on this light so we can see those buttons a little better. So if you're on, we have just a regular iPad here and it does have a home button. You can see it sort of down there at the bottom of the screen, right there. That's the home button. Now we have a black iPad. iPad. There are also white iPads too. Um, and they'll have a home button. If you have an iPad Pro, those will not have a home button. So we'll talk about how to do stuff with, I, with iPads that don't have a home button. This one will also have, let's see, there's some buttons here on the side. Let me see if I can focus that a little bit. Let me see if I can pull that back just a little bit. It's not gonna let me focus it too much just because I'm close to the camera. But here we'll have our volume buttons so we can turn our volume up, turn our volume down. We also have a button that's on the top of the iPad right here, sort of right above our camera. This will help us um, either turn our iPad completely off or we can put it to sleep or wake it up. Now your iPad might be slightly different depending on your model. Your iPhone might be different as well. Let me show you the iPhone. Let me get the iPad out of the way. So I have a case on my iPhone and I have an iPhone 11. Um, so it doesn't have a home button, but it does have buttons on the side here. So this is our side button on the iPhone 11. Um, you'll also, uh, you may have heard it referred to as a power button. Mostly Apple is either calling this the side button or the top button on an, I on an iPad. So that's my side button and that will help me turn my phone um, off, like put it to sleep or wake it up. And then on my left side here, I have my volume buttons. I also have a button that will let me toggle on or off. It sort of looks like, let me see if I can focus that a little better. Eh, it's not really gonna let me, but this will let me toggle on or off my ringer. So if I was wanting my phone on silent, I could toggle this so it's off or I can toggle so it's on. So you see it says silent mode off, silent mode on. So that will turn off my ringer or my text message noises. And I don't have any buttons at the top. It's just smooth. But then I have my cameras there. So that's buttons on an iPhone 11. If you have a, a different model iPhone, maybe an iPhone 8, iPhone 6, you may have a top button instead of a side button. Any questions about buttons? Yeah, we do have some folks that have said they have iPhone 6s. So your, um, your button that might be on the top is would be the button that controls uh, turning on and off the device and waking it up, like Rebecca mentioned. Yeah, let me get back into the PowerPoint here and we can see. Let's see here. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. So you may have either a side or a top button, depending on your model. You'll have your volume buttons, of course, your home button if you're on an older model iPhone. And then your um, you can toggle on and off that silent mode. Um, with newer iPhones as well, that side button is going to let you do a couple more things besides just wake it up and turn it off. So for instance, if you're in the app store, it might ask you to press on the side button to download an app or to purchase something. So if you're using Apple Pay, you might experience a notification that asks you to press down the side button. Um, it's just sort of an extra button so that you know, you're sure that you're going forward with that particular function. Um, but for the most part, I just use the side button for you know, turning it off, turning it on, waking it up, putting it to sleep. Yeah, so we do have a comment in the chat that um, with uh, someone that does have an iPhone 6 that their their top button is actually the side button instead. So they turn oh, okay. the power on with the side button. Okay, so the top button probably is really just an outdated button then. It's probably mostly side buttons. Mm -hmm. 
the thing about technology is everything is moving so fast yes. um, that especially with um, iPhones, I they think they release one like every year and a half, maybe. Mm -hmm. So something's bound to change, right? All right, let's go back to my demo and I can start on how to unlock the device unless anybody has any other questions. If you do, please go ahead and put your questions in the chat, or if you raise your hand, I can go ahead and uh, basically allow you to talk to ask a question if you have one. Let me raise this up a little bit here. Bear with me, I'm just going to get this up a little bit. And no questions so far. Okay. I'm just trying to get those positioned well so you can see not only the screen, but how I gesture and stuff. Okay, that looks okay. Perfect. Yep, looks good. All right. So unlocking your device also might depend on your model. So you can unlo unlock your device. Um, you sort of just wake it up and then to get into your device, you have to do something. So for us, we need to enter a passcode. Oh, sorry. Let me press my home button like I'm trying to get in there. Um, so for us, we would enter a passcode that we've decided on. So this would be like a password that will get you access to your device. Um, and usually it's four digits, but you can also set this up to be longer if you'd like. Actually, mine is also the default is uh, six. So six the new digits. iOS 14, I think, has to be at least six. OK, mine is updated all, all the way and it's still only four. OK, so maybe it depends on your device i'm not quite sure i can look more into that um but you also may have a fingerprint or touch id so that would be if you're touching the home button and it's detecting your fingerprint it will let you in that way without having to enter a passcode you may also have face id so for instance with my iphone i have face id so that it scans my face and it makes sure it's me before letting me into my device so you may have any one of those or combination of those to get into your device. And let me see if I can show you on my phone here, if it's gonna ask me for my face, let's see. So if I swipe up, here we go. So it's asking for face ID and then it's gonna prompt me if I don't do that quick enough, it will ask me to put in my passcode. So if I do do my face, let's see, then I can get in there. So basically I just held it up to my face and it detected it. And you don't have to have that activated. Um, that's up to you whether or not you want it to use Face ID. And of course you can change that in your settings. I know nowadays with us wearing masks all the time, it's harder to do Face ID because, you know, have our faces covered. So, so sometimes it's easier um, if you do the passcode, again, it's up to you. It's your personal preference. And there's really no right way to do it. It's just your personal preference. Hey, Rebecca, we have a question about whether or not um, you can hold up a photo of yourself to the phone and have it recognize your face ID. Oh. I don't think we've ever, I've ever played with that, but I would like to I don't to know, that's a good see. question. <laughs> I will write that one down. Yeah, we'll play with that one. We'll experiment with it. That's a good question. And see if it can do it. Now, I do know that we have a we have a volunteer who works here at the library who also has face ID enabled on her phone. And she said, you know, sometimes uh, when she wakes up in the morning, if she hasn't done her makeup and, you know, she doesn't have her hair the same way, um, hers will still recognize that she she is who she says she is. <laughs> if you're sitting, I, if you're angled a certain way too, it might not detect your face. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is a good point that it it's not necessarily very secure if it would if it does work with photos, um, you know, anyone could have a photo of you and and put it in front of your your phone. Um, so yes, it wouldn't necessarily, but I think it also has to do with certain points on your face where the the AR is the AR is taking per, like certain um, points and measurements that it's using. Um, but we'll find out. Yeah, I think Apple probably has a page on their website about Face ID, mm -hmm. and I can look on that and see if we can figure out what they're drawing from or what their security measures are for, you know, because of course, if you can break into a phone with just somebody's picture, that's not going to help protect you, right? <laughs> exactly. All right. So, um, 
Any other questions about unlocking the devices? Oh, someone commented that they believe it does, that the system does measure the depth in the face. Okay, gotcha. And I'm, I'll take a look on the uh, page and see if I can uh, gather more information for us too. Okay, cool. But no Thank other you, questions Susan. at the moment. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll move on. I'm gonna go ahead and enter our passcode so we can get in. And once you're into your device, you're going to come to your home screen. So for us, it looks like this. Of course, yours might look different depending on the apps that you have or how you have your device set up. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the home button as well, because your home button can do a couple things. So for us, you can't really see it right now because it's on a black sort of background, but our home button, Let's see, it's right there. It's got that sort of ring around it. So your home button can do a couple things. Um, it can bring you to your home screen, of course. So for instance, if you're in an app, like for instance, if you had an app open and you wanted to go back to your home screen, you would just tap your home button and it would go back home. It also is gonna let you open up Task Manager. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that is. But task manager is a way that you can switch between apps and close out of apps to sort of conserve your battery. We'll talk more about how to do that in a second, but you can do that by double tapping on the home button. So double tap. And we'll also talk about that for people that have iPads or iPhones without a home button. So don't worry, we're gonna talk about that. You can also activate Siri by holding down the home button. So let's see if we have Siri, here we go. What's the weather? It's currently clear and 72 degrees. All right, thank you, Siri. So for us, I just held down my home button until that little Siri icon popped up and it will look, what's the weather? It's currently clear and 72 degrees. And of course you can ask it anything. You can ask how fast does a cheetah run or what time is it in Tokyo? And it will answer you. It'll look sort of like that sort of nebulous circle icon. It's not really a full screen anymore like it used to be. It's more of just an icon that pops up. So I have an update for you, Rebecca, on that um, Face ID. So what Apple says on their website is that Face ID uh, uses their true depth camera system to accurately map the geometry of your face. Mm. Okay, interesting. So it can it catches face data, including the depth of your face and um, an infrared image of your face. Oh, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that then will hopefully prevent some of that. If you're, I mean, if you're holding up a flat image, it's probably hopefully going to prevent that if it's taking the depth of your face. Correct, because I think it is using using the um, the uh, VR AR uh, of this true depth camera. Um, mm. to make that happen. And it does say, of course, that um, it should adapt to changes in your appearance, like changing changing your hair color, or you know, if there's a very significant change in your appearance, you might have to use your passcode and then update your face data. Okay, good to know. And, and I can send that out with the email as well. You can, we can link that when we send out the video. Absolutely. All right, so that's the home button. Let's talk about um, the iPhone without a home button. Let me show my iPhone here. So, of course, you don't see an actual button on my iPhone here, but if I tap and sort of wake up my phone, I have that white bar there. That is my home button. So let me open up my phone. So I don't see the white bar here, but I think if I were to, no, okay, it's not showing up there. You, we'll, we'll talk more about how to navigate without the home button, but that white bar, sort of when you're on your lock screen, that's your sort of home button. It's indicating that it's more towards the bottom of your screen. So let's open up an app actually. Yes, here we go. So we're in an app right now. And do you see that white bar there? That's sort of an indication of where my home button is. And if I were to swipe up, that's gonna take me back home. So that's how you get home 
when you don't have a home button. You just kind of swipe up until you're back at your home screen. And it does take practice. Keep that in mind that these gestures are a big part of phones nowadays, and it does take practice. So don't feel bad if you can't get it right away. I know it even takes me sometimes uh, some time to move things around. Like if I'm moving an app, it takes me time as well to do stuff like that. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the home screen before we jump into some navigation. Um, let's go to the lock screen on the iPad. So let me lock my screen again. So anytime you put your um, iPhone or iPad to sleep, you're going to have to unlock it again. Now, there is a way to turn that off if you don't want to have to do that all the time. But I recommend that you have a sort of passcode on there or some security measure because you never know, you might lose your device. You don't want people to be able to jump right into it. But there are a couple things that you can do before you even get into your device on your lock screen. So if I swipe to the left, I can access my camera. So I can take a picture really quick. I don't have to even open up my device to get into my camera. Let me show that again. All I'm doing is swiping left and it's got my camera open. So that's a really quick way to get into your camera. You can also get into your widgets and we're gonna talk more about widgets, but if I swipe to the right, oh, let's do that again, swipe to the right. These are my widgets that I have set up and you can change these as well. We're gonna talk more about widgets towards the end of class. But these are widgets. So for instance, I could maybe see what some top news stories are, check my podcast, check my calendar. You can also um, swipe down to look at your search. So if I swipe down, sort of from the top middle, I have the ability to search. So for instance, if I wanted to search for maybe what the weather was like today, really quickly without having to get into my phone, it's going to show me based on my location what the weather is like. I can also search for apps through this too. Maybe I was looking to jump into my Libby app. I could do that right here from the lock screen without even opening up my phone. And of course, it's going to give me some knowledge too based on my search. Like it looks like Siri is suggesting some stuff. I can also search in the app store. So I recommend kind of playing around with the search function, see what it does for you when you do a search. You can also swipe down from up in the corner here by your battery signal, and it's going to give you a control center. So this is what Apple calls the control center. We're going to talk more about this, but this is sort of a quick access menu where you can get to things like your brightness, your Wi-Fi, a timer, your camera, stuff like that. We're going to talk more about this, but you can get that from your lock screen as well. You can also sort of swipe up from the middle of your screen and see notifications. So this is your notification center. So this would be notifications from apps that you have on your phone, your text messages, phone calls, you know, maybe it's giving you an update to do something or just giving you a notification. That will come here to your notification center. All right, any questions about the lock screen? No questions so far. All right. So now that we're back on our home screen, let's talk a little bit more about what it is all about. So from your home screen, of course, you're gonna find all of your apps. So I have, it looks like two home screens. And the way I can tell how many home screens I have is this, these dots right here above my dock. We're gonna talk about the dock as well. But these two dots are indicating that I have two screens in where in which my apps live. You may have more dots depending on how many screens you have. You'll also notice um, down here, I have a couple of apps in this little bar here. Apple calls this the dock. So the dock is a place where you put apps that you frequently use or wanna access from any screen. Cause you'll notice once I swipe, oops, let me do that one more time. If I swipe between my two home screens, my dock is not changing. So those apps are kind of stationary. That's useful if you're using something pretty often and you don't wanna to have to go hunting for an app, you can put it in your dock. 
And you can change these. These are not permanent. They can be interchanged with other apps. So you can change them to suit whatever needs you have. It's really customizable. That's what I like about iPhones and iPads. Super customizable. Let's see. You'll also be able to get into the notification center from this screen as well, not just your lock screen. If you swipe down from the very, very top of your screen, right in the middle, if you slowly swipe down, you'll see that notification center pop up. And you can, you can tap on those notifications to see what they're about. So if I wanted to see what this was, it would bring me to this looks like a notification from my podcast app about a new podcast that came out. You can, of course, also get into your control center from here. We're going to talk more about that as well. But I'm just swiping down from right near my battery. And I can also swipe up, let's see, to get to my widgets that are here on the side. And I can swipe down from the middle as well to get to my search. So that's a couple things you can do right from your home screen. And of course, anytime I want to get back to my home, just press that home button. Rebecca, we have a question. How, how large can your dock be? Um, I think you can put a bunch of apps down there. Let me see. I'm just moving apps in there. We're going to talk more about moving apps as well, but I'm just dragging stuff in there to see how much it will let me expand it. I think now, it's on, the full length of your screen size, at least. I think so, too. So for iPhone, I think you can only put like four apps on there because I have as many as will go. So I think iPhone is four and iPad, it looks like you were saying, Susan, it's as many as will let you. So for the iPad mini, it'll probably be slightly, slightly fewer than for the iPad Pro or the iPad Air. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And I kind of think that um, the dock is more of a quick access kind of thing. So if you put a bunch of stuff on there, it might be harder to navigate. Again, it's up to you what you want to do with your own device. But for me, I like to keep it simple, keep it easy. All right. Any other questions so far? I don't see other questions at the moment. OK. Let's jump into the settings. So for us, our settings app is right here. Um, of course, you may have it in a different spot on your device, but it looks sort of like this gray app with sort of these gears inside of it. And if I tap on it, it's going to bring me to my settings page. Let me brighten this up just slightly. Does that look a little better? Yeah. yeah can you try to focus just a little? Yep, there you go. There, there we go. go. That's better. All right. Thank you. So since we're on the iPad and we have it um, oriented horizontally, we're seeing the screen sort of split. So we have our menu here of all of our settings, but we also have what we have currently selected on the right side. So the general menu. If I were to switch this, it would look pretty much the same. It looks slightly different in my iPhone. Let me show you what it looks like in iPhone. Just because iPhone, the screen is smaller, right? So it's not going to have as much space. So I'm just seeing my menu. And if I were to click on something, let me change it so it's not in dark mode. I like dark mode. There we go. And for those of you that are unaware, dark mode just means that it's uh, a black background with white text as opposed to a white background with black text. Yes. Um, so yeah, for me, it looks slightly different than it does on iPad. It's still got all the same stuff, but it's just not split into those two menus. Let's go back to the iPad. Let me brighten that up just a little bit. Okay, so settings. Let's talk a little bit about settings. 
um, basically your settings are, are going to allow you to customize and change some of the settings that you have to do with certain apps or with your device overall. So for instance, we see things like Wi-Fi, so we can connect to Wi-Fi. We also see Bluetooth here. Let's actually go into our Wi-Fi settings here. So I'm just tapping on Wi-Fi. And that's going to show us all of the networks that are in our area that we can connect to. So currently, right now, we're connected to the Champaign Public Library's Wi-Fi. But if there were other networks in our area, they would pop up underneath the list here. And it looks like it's trying to search for more. Now, of course, yours might look different because you may be at home. So you might be connected to your home Wi-Fi or you might be seeing networks that were near you. So this might not look exactly like what you're seeing if you have a device open. Um, you'll also see that our Wi-Fi is toggled on. So it's got that green button right here, which means it's on. If I were to tap that, it would turn our Wi-Fi off. So it's kind of gray here. If I tap that again, let's we'll turn it back on. Now we're automatically joining this network just because that's how we have it set up. Um, if you tap on the network, it will give you more options. So we have it on auto join. But if you were wanting to join a network, all you'd have to do is tap on the network name. Also keep in mind that some networks you may have to put in a password to join. A lot of public places will have their Wi-Fi open without a password. So keep that in mind when you're out in public, just be careful of what you're connecting to. You may not know if it's like a legit Wi-Fi network. So keep that in mind, just be safe and try to learn more about what the networks are that you're connecting to. You'll also notice up in the top right corner here by our battery, we have a little Wi-Fi icon. So that looks sort of like a little fan. Let me see if I can bring this a little closer here. Eh, let's see. Right up here in the top, that icon that sort of looks like a fan with waves coming off of it. Let me turn the, let me turn the brightness down a little bit. Focus. There we go. Yeah. That looks good. So that icon there is letting us know that we're connected to Wi-Fi. That's sort of the universal symbol for Wi-Fi, really. That sort of fan looking, I call it a fan. Maybe they refer to it mm -hmm. as something else. I mean, it's a, it's a signal, but it does to yeah, me look signal. like a fan. Yeah. Um, the only difference is on a, on your computer or your, you know, it might be sideways. So it's like little bars. Um, but on most devices that are mobile, it's going to look like that little fan there. Okay. Any questions about Wi-Fi? I do not see any questions so far. Okay. But again, feel free to bring them up, even even if it's a little bit further on in the presentation in the presentation in the class. You can you can always ask questions. Yes. All right, let's also talk about Bluetooth because you probably have heard of Bluetooth before. It's a pretty popular um, function that most devices have nowadays. So what is Bluetooth? Bluetooth will allow you to connect to something wirelessly. So for instance, maybe you have a wireless speaker, headphones, you can connect to computer mice, keyboards, printers, some will also connect to car speakers. So for instance, I have a sort of a newish car, it's a 2017, and it will let me connect to it via Bluetooth. So I can actually use my phone and maybe I can listen to music through my phone, but put it through my car speakers. Um, I've done that before with audiobooks as well. It's a pretty common feature nowadays with newer cars. Um, <clears throat> and you'll also see when you get into that Bluetooth menu, sort of it looking similar to the Wi-Fi menu, you're going to see that ability to toggle Bluetooth on or off. And you'll also see devices that you can possibly connect to. So it looks like there is JBL Flip. That's actually a wireless speaker that we have. I'm not sure what this black web LED is. Probably someone else's device in the, in the library. Could be. And keep that in mind too. If you're in a public place or even in your home, you may sit, see things pop up that may just be in your vicinity. They may not be yours. They could just be what you're picking up 
for, from wherever you are. Um, and keep in mind too, uh, don't connect to something if you're not sure what it is, because you're not you're not sure if that could lead to something that might compromise your device. Um, <clears throat> and I usually keep my Bluetooth off unless I'm using it because it can tend to use battery because it's trying to de detect devices in the area. So I'm gonna just turn mine off and now it's not gonna list anything anymore. And Bluetooth will have that sort of Bluetooth icon. It sort of looks like a B with wings in the back, like the letter B. Let me see if I can focus that a little bit. And that's sort of a, it or even looks like scissors or like a little butterfly or something. That's a universal symbol you'll see for Bluetooth. So you may see that on your on your car. Maybe you have a Bluetooth button or something like that. So Rebecca, the BlackWeb is actually another type of Bluetooth speaker. Oh, okay, good to know. So a colleague of ours may have one of those on their desks and have connected it to the to the iPad before. Quite possibly. <laughs> All right, and we touched on Control Center earlier. Let's touch on that again, because we can actually use that to connect to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So let's do that right now. And Rebecca, we have a related question for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Do you have to have Wi-Fi on in order to use Bluetooth or are they independent? They are independent. Wi-Fi is more about connecting to internet and Bluetooth is more about connecting to a device. So the device doesn't necessarily have to have internet or anything to do with it. Um, like what, like I was saying before, you can connect um, computer mice, you can connect speakers, you can connect um, headphones. I have even a Bluetooth uh, selfie stick. So a selfie stick is just like a thing that I use if I want to take a selfie with my with my phone, and it uses Bluetooth to snap the shutter. And it doesn't have to and doesn't connect to internet because it doesn't use it. It just uses Bluetooth. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Yes. All right. So let's talk about Control Center again. So again, we're just going to swipe sort of right in that corner there at the top right where our battery icon is. And we're going to see some icons pop up. Let me lower this brightness just slightly. So for us, our control center looks like this. Yours might look different depending on how yours is set up and you can change this in settings. We'll talk about that in a second. But you'll notice here on the top left, <coughs> I have my Wi-Fi icon and my Bluetooth icon. So right now my Wi-Fi is blue because it's activated. That means it's on. My Bluetooth is not on, but if I wanted to turn it on, I could tap on the Bluetooth button and it would turn it on and it would try to detect for a Bluetooth device. Let's tap and hold on it. So if I tap and hold, let's see, there we go. So all I did was tap and hold on that icon and it's gonna show me what I can connect to. I can tap on one of those to connect or I can go to my Bluetooth settings Let's do that for Wi-Fi as well. So let me show you how I did that again. I'm gonna tap and hold. It's gonna pull up this menu. It's gonna give me more information on this menu. So it's gonna show me what Wi-Fi network I'm connected to, but I can tap and hold again and it will show me a list of all the networks nearby or I can go into my Wi-Fi settings. So I use this sort of as a quick access menu for, for pretty much um, Wi-Fi. I use it for brightness as well. And we're going to talk about that too, but you can change your screen brightness and your volume. I can also get into my camera. I have a timer, flashlight. Looks like I have a stopwatch on here. A couple of other icons as well. Including airplane mode, if you have yes. a travel by airplane. <laughs> so that's a really quick way. Maybe you were trying to turn off your Bluetooth and you didn't want to get into your whole, you didn't want to get, jump into your whole iPad and have to go through a million menus you can just pull down that control center and tap it and it will turn it off. Or maybe like you were jumping on a flight and you just wanted to turn on airplane mode real quick, right there, super quick. I use this pretty much every day. I listen to podcasts all the time, which will pop up over here. I change my brightness, my volume. 
Speaking of brightness and volume, if I go down, I have a display and brightness menu, which then I can come in and I can change my mode here. I was saying I was in dark mode on my phone, but right now I'm on light. I can toggle between those. And that will change it so that the background is dark instead of light. Or I can go back to light. I can also switch this up or down depending on how I want my screen. There's also some other options here as well. I recommend looking through the, the um, settings menu in general, just because there's so much stuff in here that you may not know you can do on your phone or your uh, tablet. I recommend just going through all the menus. You can also get into sound. Let's see if we can get into our sounds. Here we go. And we can change the volume as well. So I believe it's just ringer and alerts. We can change that. Actually, hold on. Let me see if I'm in the right menu here. I think so. I think that's just our volume. And of course, we can change that with the physical buttons on our phone as well. So if I were to touch those buttons, let me see where they are. Yes, that would change. So that's me just hitting those buttons up or down. And again, I can do that right from the control center. I can change my volume by dragging this up or down. Or I can change my brightness, same thing. I'm gonna drag it up, drag it down, decide where I want it. And you can get into your control center settings right here under your general settings. And this will let you decide what you want to show up in that control center. So for us, we have all of these ones here in our control center, but we can also add other ones too. So maybe we wanted to add um, a magnifier. Let me add dark mode as well, because I like to have dark mode toggled on or off. So then when we go back to our control center, you'll notice I have dark mode on there and I have my magnifier on there. I use the flashlight one pretty often as well. That one's super useful. Any in questions the, about, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say in the um, magnifying glass can also help with accessibility, which is, yes. as you can see, it's a whole other setting over there on the left-hand side where you can get into things like how your text looks on your screen, how big it is. Um, there's all sorts of things you can do to change um, how big your icons are. So like Rebecca said, we do encourage you to take a look at some of those and see if you know there's even like text to speech functionality, um, things like that to, that you can play with in your accessibility too. Yeah, I definitely recommend just kind of going through these and seeing what things do because you can always toggle them on or toggle them off. Um, it's kind of fun to just see what your phone can do or your device. Um, let's see, home screen. So right now my device, I have large app icons turned on just because I thought it would be easier um, to see that sort of stuff while we were doing the demonstrations. But I could turn that off if I wanted to. And if I go home, my apps are now smaller than they were. Let me go back, let me turn them on. And now they're big again. So I like to use that one. It's a little easier to see the apps. And of course, if you get into your general, let's let's cover that question that we had earlier about how to find out what kind of device you have. If you go to your settings and you click on general, and then you're gonna click about. So that's gonna tell me what I have. Okay, it looks like we have an iPad Pro that we're working with. Where our software right now we have is iOS 15. 0.2 and then of course we can have we can see all of our like model numbers we can see what all we have on our device so we have our storage here so we have capacity and availability so i have 209 gigabytes open on my device we can see how many apps i have so i recommend checking that out if you want to know a little bit more about your devices like model name or what you have. You'll also see the software update. I recommend if you're not upgraded to the most recent software to go into that menu and upgrade to the most recent software. You'll want to make sure your um, device is up to date because that's going to prevent things like security breaches or bugs or glitches. Um, I always recommend people are most up to date on that. 
And of course you can change things like your date and time, stuff like that. Any questions about settings? No questions so far. Okay. And it's just so many things in here. So see, as I'm scrolling down, there's so many, like you can get into particular app settings. Like if I wanted to change settings for my Facebook, like maybe I wanted to turn off notifications or turn off background app refresh, I could do that from here. Yeah. So I recommend checking all that out. Make sure you know what you're, you're doing when you're getting into your notifications and all that. All right. So let's move on to talking about apps and how to open them, move them, stuff like that. Let's go home. So we're just gonna press our home button. All right, let me brighten this up just, actually it's a little too bright there. Okay, so we're back on our home screen and we're gonna open an app. So to open an app, basically all I'm gonna do is tap on the picture of the app to open it. So let's open up Libby and I just tap on it. And now we've got Libby open up. And Libby is one of our library apps. So that would be if you wanted to read eBooks or listen to audiobooks, you could go through Libby. Let me go back home. And we actually do have an upcoming class in November all about our e-services like Libby and Canopy and Hoopla. Um, so if you are interested in those for your iPhone or iPad and you have not experienced them before, if you'd like, you can come to those workshops in November. Thank yes. you, Rebecca, for letting me make a quick, quick little plug there. <laughs> of course. All right. So, of course, we just um, tapped on an app to open it. And keep in mind, if you're opening an app and you're clicking the home button, you're not closing out of the app, you're just putting it in the background. So the app is still currently running, you're just not in it. You're not looking at it, but it's still running in the background. Let's talk about how to close out of those apps as well. So it's called the task manager and iPhones and iPads both have this capability, even if you don't have a home button. But let's talk about how to get to it if you have an iPad with a home button or an iPhone, same thing. You're just gonna double tap on your home button. So tap, tap. And then it's gonna pull up this screen here that's gonna show you all of the apps that you have open. So it looks like we have Safari open, we have Mango Languages, Podcasts, Libby, our settings app, our app store, music, and Hoopla. So this will let you kind of jump around between apps as well. So if you were in, Let's open up Libby again. And maybe we wanted to jump into another app right from here. I could just tap, tap, and then I could jump into, maybe I wanted to go and listen to a podcast instead. I could jump right into there. Now this works only if you have those apps open. So you can't jump into an app that you don't already have open. You would do that just by going to your home screen and then opening the app. So let's go back to task manager. You can also close out of apps from this screen as well. All you have to do is just swipe the app up. So let's swipe up and this will close out of the apps. So all I'm doing is just swiping up and you'll see they're kind of dwindling down now. So I'm just closing these out and this will help you save some of your battery, especially from apps that may use a lot of your battery like video apps or games. Those will probably suck some of your battery. Um, we'll also show how to do without a home button. So let me show how to do that on my iPhone. And this will work the same with iPads without a home button as well. So here's my iPhone and I don't have a home button. How do I get to that task manager thing? So what I do, and this does take some practice, I'm going to swipe up slowly from the bottom until I get to this sort of position here and then I'm going to let go and now these are all the apps that I have open and this will work the same for iPads and then all I would do would be to swipe up to close these or of course I could jump in between apps or get into an app that I had open I could tap that open it up do the same thing swipe slowly let go and then I can go through those apps that I have open 
And again, to close them out, you're just going to swipe up, swipe up, swipe up. And now if I do that again, it's not showing me anything because I don't have an app open. I can show that again if anybody wants to see it again. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca, do you also have a place where you can just say close all? Um, no, not really. Okay. I don't know if we do on the on our iPad either, where you can close them all at once. No, you can't do that. You have to go through the task manager. So let me show that again. Let me go ahead and open up a couple apps here. Yes, thank you. Please, um, if you can show that again on your device that does not have the home button. All right, so let me open up maybe Champaign Public Library. Let's open up Letterboxd. And you might talk through how you're how you're opening all the apps at the same time so that you're actually using that same swipe, swiping up from down below to, to then access the other ones too. Yes. So again, what I'm doing is swiping up. Basically, that's my home button. Um, so let's say I wanted to get into um, AccuWeather and now I wanted to go back home. How would I go back home without a home button? You see that white tab there? I just swipe that up and now I'm back home. And you're swiping up about half, is it about halfway up the screen? Yeah, I would say so. Let me try it again. Because if I swipe up like that, that's not, I'm holding down, right? So that's not going to get me where I want. I'm kind of swiping and lifting. Oh, that's got to mean to my tax, task manager. I'm kind of just doing it a quick swipe up okay, like that. It's sort of hard to see um, if you're just looking above. If you could see the side, my side profile, it'd probably be a little more useful. And this does take some practice, especially if you haven't done it before, um, to know how much pressure to use and exactly where you're going to put, let go of the, yes. the swiping motion. Um, so I recommend just keep practicing a little bit. It can be frustrating at first and it'll, you know, it might go somewhere else um, the first couple of times you do it. Yes. Yeah, don't beat yourself up if you can't get it right right away because it does take practice. It took me a lot of practice to get used to it because I went to an, from an iPhone with a home button to an iPhone without a home button. So it took a lot of rewiring for my brain to get used to that. Um, and yeah, I just swipe up. Now, I just swipe up and let go at the same time. If I hold down while I'm swiping, that's going to get me to my task manager. So again, it does take a little practice. Let me go back home again. I'm just sort of swiping and holding. And then I see that app floating in the background and then I can let go. And now I've gotten to my task manager. Okay, we do have um, a raised hand. Uh, I don't know if you can actually unmute them. I am unable to do that on the second laptop at the moment. Yeah, let um, me try. Let's so I don't see. know if you can do that as a panelist or not. Yes, let me try. Okay. No, it won't let me. Okay, um, I'm going to, if you if you're the person that's raised your hand, I'm going to chat directly with you and see if uh, you can put your question in the chat. Unfortunately, at the moment, I am unable to uh, unmute you, but we'll get your question answered if we can. Zoom technical difficulties. And maybe at the end of class two, we can try to, to revisit some of those questions that people want to ask out loud as well. And we can try to work through whatever difficulty we're having on our side. Yes. And I, I can do that at the end. I just didn't want to stop the, have it stop the recording. So <laughs> no problem. All right. Any questions about task manager? Uh, no questions so far. Okay. Oh, actually, uh, what does the lock button mean? Um, is it on Wi-Fi? The lock button on Wi-Fi. Or maybe, maybe within the uh, control panel? My guess is probably someone's looking at, let's go into Wi-Fi. Someone may be looking at networks that have a lock button next to them. That would be my guess. If you see a network listed with a lock icon next to it, that probably means that it's a private network that you have to have a password to access. 
Yes, thank you. And if that if that was not um, what you were referring to, please just let us know and uh, we'll continue to try to answer your question. Yes, that's my first inclination to what that question is. Okay, let me get the iPad back. All right, let me open this up again. Okay. So we've gotten through task manager. Let's talk about another thing that is sort of new to iPhones and iPads. It's something called the app library. So the app library is a way to help you find apps on your device or to sort of have your app stored on a different screen that's not your home screen. So for us on iPad, we can access app library right down here at the bottom on your dock. And you'll, if you don't have this on your iPad, you may not have the most recently updated operating system. Um, if you're on iOS 15, you'll have this little icon. It sort of looks like a, an icon with four smaller apps inside of it. Now our icon might look different than your icon because this is constantly changing depending on what apps you're opening and what you're using. So for us, it looks like this, but yours might look slightly different. So let's click on it and see what the app library is all about. Let me tap on it. So the app library, again, as I was saying before, is gonna help you find the apps on your device, but it's also gonna sort of group the apps that you have into these different categories. So for instance, you can see social apps, information and reading, creativity, and these will also change periodically depending on what you're using, how often you're using them, what you're opening, et cetera. You can do a couple things from here. You can either open up an app directly by tapping on it. You can also tap on the little group to open up that whole group there. Let me show that again. And I can tap on one of those bigger apps to open the app directly. So I've got Libby open now. Let me go back to app library. I can also search my apps as well. So if I click on this little search bar, it's going to pull up this list of all of the apps that I have on my device alphabetically. So I could scroll through that list if I was looking for something. Or I could go up here to the search bar and type in whatever it was I was looking for. So maybe I'm looking for Libby. I could type in Libby and it would pop up and I could tap on it and open that app. So this is really super useful if you have a lot of apps. Maybe you're struggling to find on your iPhone or your iPad. You can use that app library and just search for it real quick. Um, I took a trip to the Art Institute a couple, maybe like a month or two ago, and I was looking for the Art Institute app on my phone. I, I couldn't remember where I had it, um, and I went to the app library, and I just did a search for it. So let's see if I still have it on here or if I deleted it. Yep. So there's my Art Institute app, and I just tap on it, and now I've got it open. Now on iPhones, you're not gonna have that app library in your dock here. You're actually gonna have to swipe until you get to it. So if you swipe left, let me go back to my home home screen here. If I swipe left all the way over, left, left, then I get to my app library, which then I can jump into apps. Maybe I wanna jump into my reading, my books, or I can tap my search button and either scroll through or do a search. And again, these are going to be available to you if you have your most updated operating system. If you have an older iPhone or iPad that's not updated, it may not have the app library on it. Let me go back to the iPad as well, because you can still swipe to get to the uh, app library as well. You don't have to tap on that icon. Now it's super simple just to tap on it, but you'll notice if you swipe left, left, you'll also get to the app library. Any questions about the app library? No questions about the app library. Um, I did want to bring up, we had a, a someone ask about using an, the X in the top corner. Um, of an app once they brought up Task Manager. And that is the same thing as swiping up. So if you have the X um, instead of the swipe up, that's okay. That's still closing yes. out of the app. 
Yes. I think if you're on a newer operating system like iOS 14 or 15, it will probably not have the X. But yeah, that X will mean it will mm -hmm. close. Yeah, I believe that's in um, some of the uh, older the older OSs where it'll have a little X that you can close out of an app. All right. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about moving apps, deleting apps, and creating folders. Because there is a way you can sort of organize things on your home screen. So to move an app, what you'll want to do is you'll find the app that you're interested in moving, and you'll tap and hold on top of the app. So for instance, maybe we want to move Libby into our dock because we use it really often and we want it to be down there. So let's go ahead and tap and hold. So I'm going to tap and hold on Libby. And it's going to pop up with this menu here, which will let me do a couple things. If you see this button here that says edit home screen, and I tap on that, that's going to start my apps jiggling. So when my apps are jiggling, that means I'm able to move them. So then I would just tap and hold, and I can move them to a different spot. I can move them down to my dock. OK, now I've got it in the place I want it. Where do, what do I do to make it stay that way? Up here in the top right corner, I see a button that says Done. I'll just tap on Done. And now my apps have stopped jiggling. Yours may look slightly different if you're tapping on an app. Um, it may not say edit home screen. Um, keep that in mind if you're on an older uh, operating system. It may just start jiggling. It may not pop up with a menu at all. Let me actually hold down and just wait. Because I can just hold down and wait, and it will actually just jiggle, and I don't have to press anything. I can just wait for it to start jiggling. And then, of course, I can move something. So maybe I want to move my mail app out of here. And then I want to move, maybe I want to switch the order here. So I can switch things around. Now, this is the one of the things that I struggle with a lot is moving apps, especially if you're moving screens, like if I'm dragging and moving screens. Things may get a little squirrely, but keep in mind, it won't be permanent. If you, if you want to move something again, you can always do that. I definitely recommend practicing. Um, it does take a little practice to get used to the gestures, especially if you're moving between screens. So you see how I'm just clicking and dragging until the screen changes, and now I have it back on my home screen. I can hit done. Now you can also create a folder as well. So a folder will let you put in multiple apps inside of one space. So for instance, we have a couple folders up here. You'll notice they look like squares with tiny little app icons inside. If I tap on one, for instance, let's tap on the library folder. Now, these are all the apps that I have inside my folder that we've labeled library. How do I make this happen? Let's talk I, about that. Can you go ahead and focus that just a little bit better? Oh, yeah. Does that look better? It does, yeah. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So how do we create a folder? Good question. So let's create one. Let's create a new folder. What you'll do is you'll want to find out what app you want to go inside of the folder. And then you'll sort of group together the ones you want together. And then what I'm going to do, let's put these two. Let's put the Champagne Public Library app. Oops, sorry, I was holding down. Let's put the CPL app inside a folder with Hoopla and Canopy. So let's do that. Let's create like another library folder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap and hold on my CPL app until it jiggles. And then I'm going to drag it right over another app that I want to go in that same folder. And you saw how it sort of created, it blinked for a second, and then it opened up this folder for me. Let me do that again. So I'm tapping and holding, and I'm going to drag it right over another app. And now it's created a folder. Now you'll notice up here, it's sort of naming itself. Apple will actually name these folders on their own because it's guessing what you're going to put in here. So it usually draws on what the apps are to name the folder. So it thinks that this is an education sort of folder. It will name it. I can always change that too. Let's change it. Let's 
do champagne. And of course, you can always change the name of the folder as well, even after you rename it. Done. OK, and I can just tap outside the folder once I'm done with it. And then hit done. And now I have my champagne library folder. Let's move the canopy app inside there as well. I'm going to tap and hold. And I'm going to just drag it right into the folder, right where I want it to be. And of course, I can change these around if I want it to be in a different position. Tap outside the folder and hit done. And now I've got my folder. And of course, I can move this as well. I can move my folder somewhere else. Maybe I want it down here instead. And now I've got my folder moved. And with folders, you can um, have more than one screen. You'll notice when I sort of had my apps jiggling, I have two dots down here. I have the ability to create more than one screen inside of a folder. So keep that in mind too. Now, also with folders, you may not want them too full because it may be hard for you to find stuff that way. But some people like to have everything categorized in one area and maybe they just throw everything into one folder. Um, I can also, of course, edit that name again by tapping and holding while I have a folder open. And then I could edit this again if I wanted to change it. Maybe I could do like, maybe I could go back to education. Maybe I wanted to have that as an education folder. Done. So that's my folder. I can also delete a folder by taking everything out of it. So I would just tap and hold. And let's move all of these apps out of the folder. And I recommend just kind of um, playing around with your gestures and dragging and dropping because that's going to get you practice. It does take practice for this. Um, and now my folder disappeared. It's no longer here because there's nothing inside of it. Let me show you how to do that on iPhone as well. So let me open up my iPhone here. So I have a couple folders on my screen here. Um, so I have like a Google Apps folder with all my Google Apps in it. I have an uh, entertainment folder with some of my streaming stuff. And of course, I would do the same thing if I wanted to add something in the folder, tap and hold, and then I could drag it into the folder if I wanted to. Of course, this is in the State Farm app, it's not an entertainment app, but just as an example, same process for iPhones. Any questions about moving an app or creating a folder? No questions at the moment. Okay. Oh, let me make sure I'm covering everything I wanted to with that. Okay, let's talk about installing apps and deleting apps because that's a super useful thing because we do that kind of thing all the time, right? We're always wanting to get the latest things. So we're back on my iPad. So to download apps onto your device, you're going to go to the App Store. So for us, our App Store is right up here at the top and it looks like this blue app with an A. Let me focus that a little more. If you have an older device, it might look slightly different, but it still should be that blue color with an A. It might have a circle around the A, depending on how old your device is. But it sort of looks like an A, maybe made out of popsicle sticks, or it sort of looks like a picnic table or something. Definitely like a camping picnic table to me. <laughs> yes, yes. So if I tap on that App Store, that's going to open it up, and then I could search for apps that I wanted to download on my device or I could sort of browse. So down at the bottom, you'll see a couple of options. I click on, if I click on apps, that will let me browse some of the stuff that's out here on the app store. So for instance, it looks like some must haves, top free apps, kids apps. Let's actually search for an app that we wanna download. So I'll tap on search. Does anybody have a suggestion for an app they would like me to search for?
A painting app. Painting app. Okay. Let me make this a little brighter here. So again, I just went to my search bar down here at the bottom right, and I tapped on my search bar, and let's type in what we're looking for. So I'm just going to type paint, and then I'm going to hit search. And before I do that, you'll notice some stuff will come up. So these are things that are sort of auto-filling that the app store maybe is trying to guide you towards one of these categories. Maybe you're searching for paint by numbers, paintball, stuff like that. But let's just search paint and see what comes up. So quite a few things come up here. And you'll notice there are some categories up at the top. You can kind of click on maybe if you want to just kid stuff. Let me go back to the menu here. But you'll see next to the apps, um, you'll see the app icon, you'll see reviews, you'll see the title of the app, um, and you'll also see this button to the right hand side. So if I tap on Git, that will let me download the app to my device. Let's see if there's anything that costs money. Let's see what we can find here. As I scroll down, here we go. So Procreate, it looks like, is $9.99. So if it's Git, that means the app is free and you don't have to pay anything. But if it's a dollar amount, that's going to charge you based on your Apple account, whatever payment you have set up through that. Um, you'll also notice under some apps, right under the Git button, it says in-app purchases. So that means the app itself is free. But if you want certain features in the app, you may have to pay for them. So for instance, with certain photo editing softwares, you may be able to get the app for free and get some basic free functions, but you may have to unlock certain things by paying for um, paying for them, such as like filters or stuff like that. But let's let's find something to download here. So, Rebecca, I know you're about to cover. You're probably about to cover this, but how can someone tell if apps are safe to download? That's a good question. Um, I usually go off of a couple of different factors. Um, so first thing I'll do is if I'm curious about an app, I will actually click on it before I download it. So I'm going to tap on this one called Sketchbook because I'm interested in downloading it. So let me tap on the app. And now it's going to show me more information about the app. So it's going to give me ratings. It's going to tell me sort of the age group that it's for. It's going to tell me like how popular it is, but also some important stuff here, like the developer. So this is developed. This particular app here is developed by Sketchbook Incorporated. Let's tap on that. Doesn't really tell me too much. So if I was curious about Sketchbook Incorporated, I might just do a Google search and see if I could find more information about their company. Um, that way I could sort of vet them and see if they were, you know, a reputable company and if they made stuff that was, you know, not going to affect my device in a bad way. I also usually will go down and look at the ratings and reviews to see if anything is looking sketchy to me. Usually this one has looks like 211,388 ratings. So to me, that's already saying that it's a good app because there's just so many people using it. If it had maybe like four ratings, I'd be a little more suspicious about it. Um, you'll also see, let's see, there is a number, I think, of people that have downloaded the app. Mm, I think it just goes off ratings. Also, that section about app privacy is important too. Yes. So it says the developer indicated that the app's privacy practices may include handling of data as described below. So this would be something when you download the app, you're sort of agreeing to this. So keep that in mind too. You may want to look at their privacy policy and what data they're collecting. It looks like down here, there is linking the developer website. So I could click on that and then it will bring me to the developer's site where then I could read about you know, what they're doing. I can probably reach out to them if I was concerned about something. Um, let's go to the one that I use an ex as an example pretty often too. Let's see if this pops up. Here we go. So this Merlin bird ID is actually created by Cornell University. So for me, that's already giving a pretty good um, 
chance that I'll feel safe with this particular app because it's developed by Cornell. Now, if I go back down here and I click on developer website, that's going to bump me out to their, looks like it's made by Cornell Lab, it's sort of hard to see that. But the developer sort of helps me get a grab, get a, uh, an idea of, you know, if they're good, if they have any security issues, I wouldn't be concerned. Um, if it's developed by somebody like Cornell, I feel like that's more reputable than just a random one. Let's see if we can find one that doesn't look good. Let's go back to paint. So let's see, paint. So most of these have like thousands of reviews, but every once in a while you'll get one like this one only has 450. Now that doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad app, but I feel like I'm more likely to be feel safer with something that has more reviews. Like this one here only has 20 and it doesn't have good reviews. Um, also, I should say apps do have to go through something to get into the App Store. Um, Apple sort of vets them in their own way. Um, so you may have apps that are available for Android, but may not be available for Apple just because they haven't been able to, you know, make their app appealing enough to Apple to get into the App Store. And I, and I have an article about like what they do for that too, I can link to. Because every once in a while we have a question about like, how did the apps get in the App Store? What is Apple doing for security? So I can send that as well in that email that goes out. Yeah, also um, I would point out too that if there is a problem with an app, generally uh, it's not too long before the industry uh, watchdog organizations will call people, call out the certain apps that are doing things they shouldn't like with your data or your privacy or you know, having like malware installed, you know, on the back end or something. And they will, they will put something out that says, Hey, if you've downloaded this app, you know, delete your account, delete that app, uninstall it. Uh, so they're, and they did just have a case fairly recently where Apple retracted some apps that had been in the app store because they discovered an issue <laughs> like this. Um, so it's just, it is kind of important to stay sort of buyer aware. Uh, but by doing things like what Rebecca is saying and, you know, go ahead and Google the app. You might even go ahead and Google the app before you download it just to see if there's anything recent um, in, you know, of note within the new news articles um, to see if anything comes up too. Yeah. And also, you know, you might see ads on here as well. So when we do a search for Merlin bird ID, you may come up with something that doesn't have to do with it just because it's an ad. So that little blue signal there is telling me it's an ad. Um, and you'll also notice that my button says open instead of get. So that means I already have the app downloaded onto my device. Um, so for instance, maybe you were searching for Libby. Maybe you wanted to download Libby. We could search for it. So we already have it here because it says open. But keep in mind, you'll have other apps that pop up like Audible. Um, it looks like Overdrive here. If you have a cloud with an arrow pointing down, that means you've previously downloaded the app. Um, and it basically is not on your device anymore, but it was in your account in the cloud. So you can kind of download it from the cloud there by clicking on that. But yeah, this is where I would search for apps that I wanted, like Libby. Um, I could search for Hoopla as well, Canopy those will all be in the app store. So I have Hoopla here. Yeah. And again, you can you can also take a look at those to vet them just like you would other apps. Uh, but the good the good thing about uh, companies that have partnered with libraries is that they they usually libraries do have a little bit of leverage um, to say stuff like, you know, hey, um, you know, we take privacy very seriously here at the library. Want to make sure that you know, they're following uh, the best practices that libraries would follow. Um, so they do, they do take into account their user base. Too. Yes, totally. And usually if anything is happening on an app, we like to be updated in what we teach people and what we know about it. So that if you come to us for help, we're hopefully, you know, showing you the most up-to-date version. Um, any questions about the App Store?
We do have one, one question. If you download or buy an app on one device and change devices or upgrade to a new device, do you have to buy it again or can you just download it? I.e. like it's already in your, your account. You just see the cloud with the arrow. As long as your devices are both logged into the same iCloud account, then you it will be across devices. But say if you have an iPad and an iPhone and they both have different iCloud accounts logged in, they may have different apps on them because of course your apps are associated with that iCloud account. And um, when you're doing like, for instance, if you're purchasing or downloading an app, let's do one for instance, it will prompt you to, if I click install, um, it may prompt you for your, it looks like it let us do it, but it may yeah. prompt you for your iCloud account password. Yes. And that's something you can change in your settings where you can say, hey, always require me to enter the passcode when I go into the app store. Yes. So again, that's your apps are going to be beholden to that iCloud account. So if your two devices are two different iCloud accounts, they're going to be different apps on that, if that makes sense. But if you, I believe if you have, like, say you purchased, uh, like on your iPod, I'm sorry, on your iPad, you purchased an app and then you wanted to get that app on your device, I believe as long as you're logged into the same iCloud account, you can just download that from the cloud and you don't have to pay again. Mm -hmm. And they may, some apps might be, opt, this is less of a thing now, um, but some apps may be optimized for the smaller screen of a phone versus the larger screen of the iPad. Um, yes. And it'll usually say say that, and it's less of a thing now because so many people have you know a phone and a tablet. Um, so that's I don't see that as often anymore. Um, but something like yeah, I was just gonna say like Instagram, you know, it's for the phone is a little bit different, optimized for a phone over the tablet. So so you may find that too. Yeah. Um, and if you want to, yes. And then we have a question about whether or not we can put all devices on the same account. That's up to you. That's a personal choice. Uh, but I have, if you have an iPad and an iPhone and you want to link them together so that you can do this where your apps, you know, if you pay for an app and you get it for both devices, um, that's totally up to you, but you, you could do that. Um, if you share a device with someone else, uh, you may want to really consider whether or not you want to do that. So if you have one iPad for a family of four, um, you may want to have that have a specific iCloud account that's associated just with that device. And then, you know, if all four of you have iPhones, then maybe all four of you have separate iPhone or separate cloud accounts for those phones because you want to keep them separate. It's really, it's really just going to come down to um, what your use, um, use style is going to be like. Yeah, I would, I would say exactly that. Like me personally, I have both my iPad and my iPhone hooked up with the same um, iCloud account. But if like, I know my brother and my dad both have an iPhone, iPhone too, and they both have their separate iCloud accounts. Because if we had the same account, that would, I don't know, that wouldn't be like our device. You know what I mean? Again, like Susan was saying, it's up to you what, what you want to do. If you're the only one using it, I would say it's probably fine to have all your devices on the same account. Yeah. And then um, another thing to consider is how many, so this is uh, true for things like purchases in the app store of entertainment, things like songs or music, or well, songs or music, music or movies. Um, they, the app store will give you so many devices that you can put those things on. So, you know, if you want to link your phone and your ta your iPad and have that movie to be available on both of those, that's fine. Um, I think it's something like seven devices. So if you had a family of seven and each you wanted a particular movie to be able to be downloaded by all seven people in the family, then that is something that you could do with one iCloud account because you can register up to seven devices with that account. So... And it depends. And I would have to check to see uh, what is currently the number of devices, too, and if they're still doing that with with Apple. I know that that was true in the past. But of course, I, I don't actually I haven't gotten to the point where I was restricted and not able to put it on something. <laughs> but as long as you have registered devices, 
then they're basically authorized to have that content. Right. And I would say it's probably easier for you to keep track of if you're you if you're one person and you have multiple devices, it's probably way easier to keep track of this, your own personal stuff if you just have it on one account. And when you, you know, when you upgrade to a new phone uh, and say you're getting a, an iPhone 13 um, from, you know, an iPhone 6, that's a big, a big jump um, in the operating system and everything else. But as long as you're using that same iCloud account, it should recognize the apps that you had before mm -hmm. on the on the earlier device and let you continue to um, have those on the new new one as long as it's supported. Yes, yes. I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah. Thanks for letting me jump in there too, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, let me go back home here. Okay, so we've talked about installing apps and how do we delete the apps off of our devices? Because of course, maybe you've downloaded a bunch of apps that you no longer use and you wanna take them off your device. Um, I know every once in a while I'll go through my devices and see what I'm using and what I'm not using and just go, do I really need this on my device anymore? And then I'll delete the ones I don't need. Um, I like to kind of do an audit like that every once in a while. But to delete an app, it's pretty similar to moving an app. What you'll do is you'll want to come to where the apps live. So on your home screen and you'll find the app that you want to delete. And what you'll do is you'll tap and hold on the app. So let me lower the brightness here and focus it. Let's find an app that we want to delete here that won't cause too much trouble. Let's let's see here. But we can always put an app back on. So let's delete Kindle since we don't really use that one. So I'm going to tap and hold on my Kindle app. And then I'll notice this will pop up or I can wait for it to jiggle. Let me do that again. So I have my menu and you'll notice right here it says remove app. If I tap on that, it's going to give me an option here of a couple things. So I can either delete the app, which would take it off my device or I can remove it from my home screen. So what does that mean? If I click on remove from home screen, it will take it off my home screen, but it will still be on my device. And I can find it either by searching or going to my app library. So let's delete the app. And then it's gonna ask me, do I really wanna delete it? And then I can hit yes, I want to delete it, or I can hit cancel. Let's hit cancel. Let me do the delete from home screen. So I'm going to tap and hold, hit remove app, remove from home screen. So now it's gone from here. But if I go to my app library and I search, it's right there still. So that's sort of another way to clean up your screens. You can take stuff off your home screen and just use your app library to find it, especially if you have a lot of apps that you don't really like on your device, like the look of it. It looks like it's also here in our recently added section. But of course, I can go here too. Let's do Kindle. And maybe I did want to delete it. I can tap and hold. And I can hit delete app from there as well. Let's delete it. So now it's deleted and gone. I can also just tap and hold. Let's delete something else here. Let me find something that is easy. Let me delete this Merlin bird ID. We can always put that back on. So I'm going to tap and hold. I can also just wait for it to jiggle. And then I can hit that little minus button in the top left corner. If you're on an older device, it may have an X button instead of a minus, but it's the same thing. You're just going to tap it. And then it's going to ask you, do you want to delete it or do you want to remove it from your home screen? Let's go ahead and delete app and then hit delete. And now it's deleted. Then I can hit done and now it's gone. So that's how you delete an app. And if any you questions? I was just gonna say, and if you accidentally delete something, um, you know, you go past where it said delete and you go, yep, I delete. You can always go back into the app store if you didn't mean to delete it and search for it again. And then do what Rebecca's doing now where she's gonna show you that you can just hit, um, instead of open, it's gonna say, the, the, we'll have that little cloud icon because yep. it's still in my cloud. Yes, because you've downloaded it previously. The App Store knows that you had it before. 
Yes. And so you can just, you know, it's sort of like the edit undo button <laughs> on a computer for uh, apps that you accidentally delete. But that is one of the reasons why they give you that uh, secondary prompt where it says, you know, do you want to delete this app? Yes. And of course, once I download it back onto my device, it's going to sort of be right at the end, uh, like the last slot that I have open on my home screen. And of course, I could go ahead and move that, but it will usually show up in that last slot. Any questions about deleting? You may also have heard of uninstall. It's technically that too, uninstalling. Yes. And we did have a, a comment from someone who said that, uh, like we were talking about the different versions of OS. So, you know, if you have an older device versus a newer device, sometimes the app developer, developers have done different things to increase or enhance the app, meaning it'll only work on the newer versions. Um, so if you don't see something in your app store uh, as you're searching for it, it may mean that it is too new or has features that don't work on your device. So sometimes when you go to the app store, it might say something like, hey, you know, this app is no longer supported for your device. And that means that, you know, unfortunately, as technology, the only constant in technology is change, which means that, you know, as devices get old, are older and older, you know, as things advance past the point of them being supported, that's unfortunately one of the, one of the obsolescence things that happen a lot with, <laughs> yes. with technology. Yeah. So. The other day, someone brought in an older iPad. I think it was like maybe five or six years old and it couldn't update past, I think, iOS 12 or mm -hmm. something like that. And it wouldn't let us use the Libby app in the same way. Um, so keep that in mind if you're on an older device. You know, these apps are constantly updating. So it may leave you behind if your device is too old, like Susan was saying. Um, and you can update your apps as well. If you go to your app store and you click on apps and up at the top right, you'll see a little person icon. That's your profile where then you can go and then check your updates. So I could go here and update my apps um, on my iPhone. I have like so many updates on there that I need to do for my <laughs> apps. I usually do it here at work because it takes, I like to use the Wi-Fi. Um, it looks like I have 96 apps that I need to update. So I just go to apps and then I could go down here and then I could, I could either update all or I could update, you know, maybe I just wanted to update a couple at a time. I could choose which ones I wanted to update. And you can set in your settings, you can set things to auto update as well. Um, and that is a personal choice. Again, some of us like to have the control over which apps we update and when, um, you know, and as best practices go, I, up, I go and check once a month to see if anything needs to be updated. And then I, I do it manually. Um, but you can mm -hmm. also go in your settings and just say, you know, like auto update um, for things. Yes. And you can say auto update over uh, why, when I'm connected to a Wi-Fi network. So then if it's particularly like a phone, then it's not using your cellular data to download all those apps or update them. Exactly. Um, and it does take time. So if I were to sit down and update all 94 of those apps, it'd probably take me a while. So keep that in mind too, when you're updating. Yeah. Do you uh, mind showing on the iPad, Rebecca, where, to, where the, in the settings you can choose to auto update? Yes. Let me get into the I, uh, iPad here. Let me go back here. And really it's, uh, you can check for updates and you can automatically check for updates as well. So you'll see there's a software update, but there is, I believe, let's see. App and the store. software update would be the iOS. So that would be updating from like iOS 14 to iOS 15 and it letting you know. Right. So the software is for the device overall. Um, if we go into our settings and click on App Store right here, it will let us decide if we want those updates to be automatic, like Susan was saying. So right here, we have it toggled on because it's green. If I didn't want it to be updated automatically, I could tap that off. And then I would have to go in and manually update the apps. And just like everything else, there, there are pros and cons to each, each method. It's just going to depend on and come down to your use habits and how you want things to work for you. Yes. 
And you may also find, speaking of older devices, as we were earlier, you may find that the apps still work. They may just not have the newest features. Um, usually, I like to have the stuff be the most updated, though, if you can. Um, because again, it's going to help you with any security threats that may happen or glitches or bugs that exist. That's why these apps constantly update, right? Because they're always, you know, improving, always finding what those glitches are. Um, so that's why you'll probably have to update your apps quite often. Yeah, or or they're improving features too. Yes, or adding new features, like mm -hmm. Instagram, for instance, just rehauled a bunch of stuff. Okay, any other questions about apps? Doesn't, let's see. Um, nope, uh, we've got we've got folks saying thank you because um, of, for showing them where the um, audio update was. Oh, cool. Yet another feature of the settings menu. Yes. Okay, let's talk about something that is kind of new so with iOS 14, um, there was something that they implemented called widgets. So we talked slightly about widgets before from our lock screen and from our home screen. So these are those apps that we can swipe to. Um, now this is on iPad and you can also get widgets for iPhones. So widgets are sort of um, a timely way to get access to your apps without opening them. So for instance, like we were seeing here, I could see some information here like on my calendar, maybe if I had an event today that would pull up. Can you make that a little darker? So people can see the calendar there. Okay. Perfect. Thank better. you. Yes, much better. Um, and again, these can be changed as well. We'll we'll go through how to change those or delete them. Um, it looks like I have a widget for my podcast. So it's telling me what my new podcasts are that I can listen to. It's also got some news stories I can go through. And this is all without having to open the app from the home screen. It's kind of just a quick access to some of your apps. Now, how do I get a widget and what can I do with it? So to add a widget, what you'll want to do is from your home screen, you can tap and hold either on an app or in a blank space. So let's do that. Let me turn this up a little bit so we can see that. So I'm just gonna tap and hold on this sort of empty space right here. And then I'll notice my apps are jiggling. And then up in the top left corner, I see a little plus icon right there. So if I tap on that plus icon, that's gonna let me add widgets. So, and the left side here, I can see all of the different widgets that I can add. So again, these are just little sort of spaces that you can add to your home screen that will give you a little snapshot of what's going on inside that app. So for me on my iPhone, I have a weather widget because I like to really get a quick view of what's going on without have to, having to jump into the app. Um, I have an iPad. Uh, podcast one. Um, I have a clock one, but you can add other ones too. Like we can add a Libby widget. We can add a widget for our mail, photos. There's so many different ones. Let's do weather. So if I wanted to add this widget, I would just tap it here from the menu where I've selected it. I could decide by swiping what size I wanted it. Maybe I wanted it big, medium, or small. Once I've decided on my size, I can click add widget. Let's do a medium one, add widget. Now you see it went up there in the top left corner, but like an app, I can move that. Maybe I wanted it down here. And again, this does take practice because you see, look how kind of crazy these apps are going. Let's put it down here and I'm just gonna let go. And once I'm done and I've, that's where I want it to live, I can hit done. And now I have my widget here. Oop. And I can see here, I've got my little forecast for the rest of the day. I can tap on that widget and it will bring me to the weather. Um, it looks like it's bumping me out to my Safari app, which is gonna show me um, the weather. It's got Cupertino, but I can change that to any location. Let me go back here. I think if I tap and hold it, I can edit my widget. 
Yes, then I can change my location. And this is a good time to actually mention that um, that particular app requires to know your location because it is giving you the weather at your particular location. Yes. Um, lots of apps, especially for um, the App Store, when you download them, it'll walk you through what things they're asking permission to access, which is another way to kind of to vet some of those apps. If an app asks for access to your photos, but it seems to have absolutely nothing to do with editing photos or painting things or, or whatever, and you're a little suspicious of it, that's another chance when I would go out onto the web and research a little bit more of that app before I download it. Um, things like Yelp, which of course is trying to give you uh, restaurants in the area where you are, it makes sense that it would need your location information. Yes. So here for us, it's asking me if I want to allow it or not allow it. Now, of course, if I hit don't allow, it's really not going to let me use the features of it because it's dependent on my location. So let's go ahead and hit it allow. So now you'll see my champagne is updated. Um, let's add another widget here. Let's do plus. Let's add, um, let's add a clock widget. I'm kind of a clock nerd. So let's see what I want to do here. I like this one. Okay, that's a good location for me. So I'm just going to hit done. And of course, I could change that location at any time. I can move the other one as well. Let me see if I can do that. You have to see, do this app when it's no longer when it's <laughs> maybe um, no longer shaking. Let me try and move it just like an app. Uh, there we go. See, it even takes practice for me. Let's hit done. And now I can edit it if I tap and hold and hit edit. Then I could change, for instance, what the app or what the clocks were on there. Um, and you can even stack widgets too. So let me add another one and stack it on top of that clock one. Let's hit plus and so then yes, let's- um, Rebecca, we have uh, a comment while we're working on things that are asking for location. Um, and you can't just put your location in once and be done with it. It does, it does retain location information, but it is individual to each app. So, mm -hmm. so for example, since Rebecca has just said, yes, weather app, you can access my location. Um, that weather app from now on will be able to access her location. So if she goes to another city, it'll, it can access her location for when she's in that city, and then it'll show the weather in that city. So if she was to go from... Champagne to Chicago. Um, once the it detects that she's in sh the location information detects that she's in Chicago, then it would give her the Chicago information too. I would have to change it to my location instead of Champagne, though. Correct. Yeah. So if you're doing my location, then that my location one follows you around. Um, yes. Once she it's says got that little signal yeah. there. Yeah. So the th oh, and then the question is: um, Once you've said Champagne, can you turn off the access to location? Um, I think it refreshes constantly. So I think you, if you turned it off, it might not give you the most updated information. Correct. That, at least that's been my experience. My experience is if I give it the location information so that it pulls up champagne today um, with today's weather report, and then I go in tomorrow and I say, you know, don't use the location data. Basically, like Rebecca said, it loses that functionality. So it will not give me the updated weather forecast for, you know, Wednesday instead of Tuesday from my location. And you can get into the location. Um, let's go back here to settings. If I go to settings and I go down to privacy and I click on location services, it's going to let me to it's going to allow me to change those for individual apps. So maybe I wanted my Facebook to only use it while I was using the app, or I didn't want my um, news app to ever use my location. I can change that depending on what the app is. And yeah, if you're ever concerned about the location services, I'd also say just Google it. Like, why does this app need my location? Yep. Google is your friend. 
<laughs> well, and you don't necessarily have to use Google. I mean, you could use whatever search engine you want. You That's true. DuckDuckGo or <laughs> Bing <true>. or <laughs> whatever, whatever you one you want to use. Google kind of became its own verb there. <laughs> so whatever search engine you prefer, you can go out and use that to um, to search and, and find information on, on apps and what, what they claim they need to access. Yes. For permissions. Let's go ahead and uh, do the stacking because you can stack widgets. So let's add another widget here and stack it on top of another one. So I'm going to do add widget. And then you'll see that it added it to a new location, but I can actually stack these since they're the same size. So I can click and drag it right over the top of the other app and you see how it kind of just absorbed it sort of like when we were making a folder and you'll notice to the right of it it's got two little dots so that means I have two things stacked there if I hit done then what I can do is I can actually swipe that and sort of flip through those I have that on my phone too let me show you mm -hmm. so it's a nice method of, of saving space on your home screen so I have on the top let me lower that brightness a little bit on the top left of my iPhone screen I have an app or I'm sorry a widget for the weather and I also have it stacked so I have my clock widget of course because I'm a clock nerd and I have my um, podcast widget and these are super useful because you can just jump right into those apps so if I wanted to know the weather like I use that one because I don't want to have to jump into my weather app to find out what degree or if it's raining or something it's nice to just have that widget there. And if I tap it, it will open up the weather app, which then I could kind of look at my forecast for the day or for the week or whatever. So I like widgets a lot. I think they're kind of cool. And of course I can move that or um, if I wanted to add one for my iPhone, I would do the same thing. I would hit that plus button and then find my widget and add it to my home screen. Now you'll probably have noticed that with the iPad, there was that sort of second screen as we swipe to the right. We have this menu of widgets, which we can also access from our lock screen, but this can also be edited if I tap and hold, um, edit home screen, then I could add or subtract widgets from here. I don't need that map one on there, but let me add one. Let's add, um, let's add a Libby widget, add widget, and now I've got that one on that second screen there. So you can have all your widgets live on this screen and not on your home screen. Um, that's up to you. But with iPhone, let me just double check and see if this is true. With iPhone, you also have that yes. So let me go to my iPhone, hit done. So if I'm on my iPhone, um, I would just swipe to the right, and now I've got the widgets that I have available for my iPhone. And of course, I could change these. I hardly ever use this screen, um, so my widgets are just random. But of course, you could make them whatever you wanted. Any questions about widgets? I don't see any widget questions. Um, I do uh, have a question. That is that your the last of your yes um, until okay. we get to like additional resources stuff. But yes, okay. So because this this is a question that may open up a little bit of a broader um, topic. Uh, but we did have someone ask if uh, security is an issue for older devices. Um. Yeah, I, I think it probably is. In my experience, all I've heard um, from Apple is to prevent security issues, make sure you're updated to the most um, recent operating system. And of course, if you're on an older device and you can't, then you possibly open up, open yourself up to security issues. Um, I can't speak too much on that because I don't have too much of the knowledge on it, but I can definitely look more into it. But I, I'm leaning towards, yes, there may be security issues. Um, and we'd also, I mean, we also, of course, preface this by we are, you know, we're library technology helpers. Um, so we, as Rebecca saying, we don't necessarily have the behind the scenes knowledge of how the, you know, Apple devices are programmed and coded behind the scenes or, you know, what folks are doing to break that. So 
uh, as Rebecca's saying, it's it's a good idea to stay as updated as you can. Um, and if you you know if you really prefer having an iPhone six um, and you don't have an issue with you know again it comes down to how you use it too. If you know you you don't use you don't need the newer shinier apps you don't need the new functionalities that come from something else um, and you like what you have. Um, you just want to make sure you stay conscious and aware of if there are any security issues that Apple has put out or presented mm -hmm. in, you know, their research and their literature for people. Um, you know, I think I read somewhere fairly recently that they're going to stop supporting um, the older phones soon-ish. But again, you know, they, that it's the soon-ish. Um, and that happens with computers as well, where, you know, they stop supporting in a one version of a, a web browser, for example. And if you haven't updated to the newest version of it, you know, this, this version isn't going to be supported. Um, mm -hmm. And when they say that, they really mean that when they push out updates or they find issues with it, that is when they release those updates. So if something's no longer supported, it means they're, they're no longer paying attention to what could go wrong with it. Or it's sort of like they're retiring it almost. Exactly. So they focus then the, and I say they as kind of a nebulous big they, um, but they'll focus their, ener their energy on protecting and helping users protect the newer things that they've, that they've put out there. So when something is no longer supported, um, it, it basically means that it, it might still have functionality for you and, and do what you need it to do, but you might have to be more aware of things that could that it could be susceptible to. I don't know if that's a great answer, but <laughs> and, and I can send more info about like yeah and security on older devices. And that also leads nicely into talking about the additional resources too, because um, you know one of the great places to go is you know support Apple's support page um, to yeah, find let me out get that real quick what stuff they've got for you. Let me share my screen here. All right, I hope you're seeing a, a web page here. Yes, we are. Okay. So yeah, one of the things that I've put in the additional resources is links to the Apple support page. Um, I highly recommend the Apple support page if you need help with certain topics or with your device um, or even your like software. Um, so we can actually, if we go to support.apple.com, we can search through the different sort of categories they have, or we can do like a specific search. So maybe you were looking for a specific topic. Um, the cool thing about the support page is they also have manuals. So like they have like getting started manuals. So let's go to the iPad um, page and see if they have one. So we have iPad support. Let's see if we go down here. And I recommend checking these out if you're, get, if you're interested in getting an iPad or even if you have one and wanna learn more about it outside of the realm of the library's webinar today. Um, you'll see down here under resources, there's iPad user guide. So if I click on that, that's gonna bring me to their sort of guide about how to get started. And you can like search this guide by using the search bar here, or you can jump to a certain topic Maybe you're wanting to know more about Siri. You can click on Siri and then, you know, learn more about it there. Um, there's security and privacy here, it looks like. Some info about that. So, yeah, I recommend those user guides. There's also one for iPad, uh, iPhone. Let me go back to iPhone here. So iPhone, let's see here. Here we go. iPhone user guide. And let's see what it has. So your phone, and it will jump to older phones too. And it, it looks like it says supported models. Let's see what that is. This guide will help you get started using iPhone and discover all the amazing things it can do with iOS 15, which is compatible with the following models. So it looks like it's still compatible with iPhone 6. So that's good, that's good news. So that means you can update to iOS 15. Um, let's go back here. Oh, let's go to table of contents, your phone. So if you were, for instance, maybe wanting to learn more about your iPhone 8, you can click iPhone 8, and then you have certain things that you can look through, like table of contents. 
So of course you could go jump into basics or apps or Siri again. And then it's got some getting started topics. So yeah, I recommend kind of browsing around on their support page. Um, and you can even again search. So maybe if we were searching for, um, I don't know, um, how to delete an app. Let's see if it's, it shows anything. There we go. So it looks like it kind of tells us a little step-by-step. -step. So you could even type something in like that and it would show you a little topic and some pages on some stuff related to your search. I really, really recommend that page. I use it all the time, especially for these classes. I draw a lot from Apple's information. Let me go back to my um, PowerPoint here. Let's see. Let me see if it'll let me go to the slide I want to go to. Nope. It's going to have to go hit a bunch of buttons to get there. Bear with me. I'm just going to pull up our additional resources page, which is going to be included in that handout that we send out. Um, but these will link to those pages that I was showing, like with the Apple support. Come on. Here we go. Um, I also put a link to some of the new features with iOS 15. I didn't cover really too much on that because some of the features were some of the things we wouldn't cover. They're more of personal stuff, like with messages, video sharing, stuff like that. Um, I also put a, a link to using gestures. Um, so it looks like this one's for Face ID, but gestures are a, are a big part of iPhones and iPads. So that link might help you as well. I also put some links there for how to create widgets. And those are all from Apple Supports page. And then of course, next week we're going to have intro to Android phones and tablets, which Susan will be teaching. And then the following week is getting to know Kindles. And then November is coming up as well. Let's see if we can get that slide. Come on. Why isn't this going? There you go. I see November now. There we go. So November, we have the ebook classes. So we're going to be covering how to access the library through the library resources, how to access ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and movies and music, and more. We have some new features with some of the apps that we have. We'll also do intro to online shopping because that's going to be coming up for Christmas and all the holidays and getting started with the internet part one. Part two will follow in December. And then, of course, you can always reach out to me at any time. You can call me or email me. Um, Susan as well, if maybe you want to put in your info there, Susan. But yeah, if you have a question after class or any time, feel free to reach out. And then, of course, we do also have book a librarian sessions. So if you wanted to book a session, it would be a one on one session with a staff member here. You could visit champagne.org slash book a librarian and fill out the form there. You can always call us too. You don't have to book that online. You can call us and say, hey, I want to book a librarian. And then they could walk you through the process of doing that over the phone. And then I think that's all I have. I'm happy to show something again or um, answer any questions. Oops. So we have a question about um, if we're going to teach anything on privacy. And I was going to mention that yet yeah, this second, it, we cover it a little bit in the intro to online shopping um, as far as it relates to your privacy as a user, um, like building, building accounts and things at online re retail establishments. Um, and we will cover it a lot more in the part two of getting started with the internet class, which will be in December. We'll talk a lot more about the um, sort of industry best practices for helping to keep your accounts secure, as secure as we can, because of course nothing's 100%. Um, but there are some best practices of ways that you can, you can help keep your, your information safe um, up to a certain point. Because we only have, we have so much control, but not all the control. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so we will be covering more of that. Um, we do also generally have the Illinois Attorney General's Office come. 
uh, and talk about internet security and privacy and scams and things like that. And they will likely be coming in the spring. Um, and so look for that on the calendar for spring of 2022. So, okay. Other questions, comments for, um, I'm gonna, gonna see, turn on your video. Well, I was gonna say, I'm gonna turn on the video, but it's gonna be the opposite laptop because of the other one. So let's see if this will work. Okay. Yay. <laughs> so I have alternate, alternate uh, camera over here. <laughs> I see someone has a question about how to get the video. So once we have the recording of this webinar already, we will send out the link to our YouTube channel. Like it will link right to the video. Um, and that way you can watch it in your free time. You can watch it again. We also have a, a, a list of all the previous webinars we have recorded on there. If you go to champagne.org slash YouTube, um, you can find the link to our YouTube on that page. And of course I'll email that um, I can put once, chat here once the recording is over, we'll email with the handout, um, an activity sheet, and then the link to the recording. So you'll have access soon. And uh, I do appreciate we had a comment today uh, from someone who has attended the workshop a couple of times. Um, we always encourage you to attend it as many times as you'd like. Um, you know, if sometimes the first while through, it's it's nice to just kind of get get a sense of what's going on, and then to be able to immerse yourself kind of in the activities and and trying to follow along um, the next time and the time after that. Because as with anything with technology, the more you practice. Um, the more uh, your muscle memory will kick in and the more your brain will kind of engage and go, oh yeah, that's what we did in class. Okay, I remember that's what we did. That's what I do mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe I can try this. Maybe I should try this. Um, so we do, we do recommend you come to as many as you like and you can come to the same one as many times as you want. So Yes. And, and of they, course, practice, 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 practice. It just yes. takes time and practice. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. all. And and eventually, you know, hopefully you'll feel more comfortable. The, the goal here is to have a safe, fun environment for you to feel more comfortable uh, with technology and get a chance to ask your questions. Um, chances are, if you have a question, someone else either has the same question or it'll spark something for them um, so that we can get technology to help you, not hinder you in your day-to-day -day life. As my Any... <laughs> two-minute elevator speech yes, about yes. <laughs> what we're trying to accomplish here <laughs> for, for everyone. <laughs> All Any right, other well... questions? All right. Doesn't look like we have any other questions. Thank you, everyone, for coming today and uh, for having such nice comments for us. Yes, thank you. We do we do appreciate it, and um, we're we're here to help. So. Yes. Let us know how we can help. So. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All righty. And now.